Welcome back to It's Your Case, presented by VetCT.com. I'm Heather Chalmers, your radiologist on demand for this week. Today's example, it's a 10-month-old standard poodle with one week of grade 3 out of 10 lameness on the right front limb. The dog is still willing to run and is otherwise well. You find pain on right elbow flexion during your orthopedic examination. Here today, I will give the chance to review the radiographs by taking a bit of time in this video to show them to you and pausing on each one. Starting here, I have a flexed lateral view of the left. While you're looking, I can't help but mention standard poodle is a favorite breed of mine. Here I'll show the right lateral view, a little bit less flexed in this case. So I'll give you a moment to look at the right elbow. For those who are hoping for more than one view of each elbow, I'm with you, but we will work with what we have. In principle, as a radiologist, I would always prefer and suggest orthogonal views. In practice, of course, we need to be flexible. Now that you've had a chance to look, I will highlight some of the most important findings in this case. Since we've started our musculoskeletal section, I'll emphasize that for orthopedic studies, in particular, I like to keep a systematic approach. I think it's paramount, but it's so much harder in orthopedic than other body areas because every orthopedic study is different. Whereas with thorax rads, we know we can always assess the heart, the lungs, the pulmonary blood vessels and follow our approach. Assessing an elbow is totally different than assessing a stifle. So what I like to do is I use an approach called ABCDs. This stands for alignment, bone, cartilage, devices, and soft tissues. Over the next several weeks, we will work through the ABCDs in each video. Today, I want to focus on B for bone. So let's agree that we've already looked over A for alignment. I'm going to zoom out a little bit to give us a bit more context. Here, let's start with the left elbow. My approach to B for bone is the same every time. It doesn't matter what joint I'm looking at. I always start to trace every bone on every view. In this case, I could start by tracing the radius. And then I would also trace the ulna here. If we had an orthogonal view, I could go ahead and do that. I often like to have them side by side if I have more than one view of the same region. When I'm tracing B for bone, I look at the cortex. So this entire area that's more opaque would be the cortex. I look at the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is here between the cranial and caudal cortex on the lateral view. You might notice if you're paying attention to the opacity, as I go down the medullary cavity here in the left radius, there's a change in opacity. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. My other two things that I do as I'm tracing the bone is I always trace the periosteal surface and the endosteal surface. Depending on the size of the bone and the nature of the case, I might do this at the same time and kind of look at it all at once, or I might allow my eye to do both surfaces totally separately. My last thing that I do, depending on the area that we're looking at, whether it's an elbow, a stifle, a shoulder, et cetera, is I always take time to consider what's special about this joint. Of course, in dog elbows, especially when we have a young, large breed dog, one of the highlights of B for bone is gonna to be to make sure we've looked at the shape of this medial coronoid process, which I'm showing here on the lateral view with the yellow arrows. But for today, we're talking about B for bone, and I imply that I see an abnormality here in the mid-diaphysis of the left radius. You can see that this is characterized, I'm just trying to move my circle here, sorry. You can see that this is characterized by a change in opacity. So remember that the normal medullary opacity that we see here, that's a little more radiolucent than this region that I've circled, the normal medullary opacity is partly more lucent because the medullary cavity contains fat. So when I start to see increased opacity, I think about tissue in this area that is now no longer fat, but soft tissue. This can be from cells, inflammation, hemorrhage, et cetera. That would be my main findings on this view. Let's go to the right side and have a look there too. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more to allow us to see not just the ulna, but the distal radius in this case. And I might not have given you enough chance to look at that at the beginning. So I'm gonna give you a second to look at that now. So here's your time to do B for bone and look through the cortex, medullary cavity, periosteal and endosteal surfaces, as well as take a moment to hit the highlights of any anatomic area like the medial coronoid process. 
So what you may notice as you go through your B for bone on this nice lateral view is that we again have a similar feature here in the distal radius. And I'm also concerned about increased opacity in this proximal ulna area here. These findings, these findings again are consistent with increased opacity due to a change from medullary fat to medullary soft tissue due to cells, hemorrhage, edema, inflammation. Now, many of you will immediately jump to panosteitis for this case, given our findings and the clinical history. And I agree, it's always a great feeling when our radiographs take us to a clear diagnosis. Of course, in any case, we would not stop at B for bone, even with our exciting findings that we have. We would continue with the rest of our systematic approach. Next week, we will continue our orthopedic series and practice our ABCDs. Until then, be sure to review the full report associated with this case. Thanks for listening. And remember, it's your case. So please post your questions on social media.